videotape the Know Your Records program here, so thanks for your patience. Uh, there was a big event happening at the College Park building where we usually videotape these lectures, and they just didn't have enough audiovisual support. Or they did, but I didn't want to make them too rushed. So we're doing it here today, so uh, welcome. My name is Andrea Bassing Matney. I'm with the Customer Services Division here with the National Archives. And welcome to the Know Your Records program. We have weekly programs here, uh, usually on Tuesdays, uh, once a week, and it usually gets repeated on Thursdays. We flipped it around a little bit because we're having a workshop this week, uh, tomorrow and Thursday. So hopefully we'll see you for that too. So we have workshops and we have lectures, we have um, symposiums, and we also have the annual genealogy fair that's coming up on April 22nd and 23rd. You'll see flyers out and about the building. Hopefully you can come and attend that. And um, so today we have Damani Davis. I'm so pleased to hear his lecture. I hear it's fantastic. Uh, and we left some handouts for you. And if you have to leave early, I ask please uh, fill out the evaluation form that was in your handout packet before you go. Those are actually tied into our budget. And it's very helpful to get that feedback. So today is Exodus to Kansas, and pardon me for reading, the 1880 Senate investigation of the beginnings of the African American migration from the South. Damani Davis examines federal records relating to the Kansas Exodus, the Exoduster movement, which was the first instance of voluntary mass migration among African Americans. This mass exodus was significant enough to generate considerable attention throughout the nation and resulted in a major Senate investigation. Damani Davis is an archivist of the uh, National Archives Research Support Branch, Customer Services Division here in Washington, D.C. He has lectured at local, regional, and national conferences on African American history and genealogy. Damani Davis is a graduate of Copen State College in Baltimore and received his MA in history at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Today's program is approximately one hour long and we hope that you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Well, good morning everyone. Exodus to Kansas, the 1880 Senate investigation of the beginnings of the African American migration, migration from the South. I'm gonna begin with a quote from that particular investigation. <clears throat> In the spring of 1879, thousands of colored people, unable longer to endure the intolerable hardships, injustice and suffering inflicted upon them by a class of Democrats in the South had in utter despair fled panic stricken from their homes and sought protection among strangers in a strange land. Homeless, penniless, and in rags, these poor people were thronging the wharves of St. Louis, crowding the steamers on the Mississippi River, and in pitiable destitution throwing themselves upon the charity of Kansas. Thousands, thousands more were congregating along the banks of the Mississippi River, hailing the passing steamers, and imploring them for a passage to the land of freedom where the rights of citizens are respected and honest toil rewarded by honest compensation. The newspapers were filled with, the, with accounts of their destitution and the very air was burdened with the cry of distress from a class of, a class of American citizens flying from persecutions which they could no longer endure. Now that particular quotation comes from the minority report of that Senate investigating, meaning the two uh, Republicans at that time who were involved. And I'll go into a uh, deeper uh, uh, analysis of the uh, Senate investigation. But before I go into that, I wanted to uh, just put the Kansas exodus in this historical context as far as how it relates to the overall history of African American migration. <clears throat> Uh, within African American history, uh, migration has been central to the black experience. Uh, you know, many of the, uh, the uh, 20th century history was filled with that uh, demographic and the cultural change that came with it. And uh, in this quote, I basically say that uh, any adequate understanding of African American history and culture must consider how migration has transformed and shaped the larger American society, African Americans as a people, 
and African American families in particular. When we look at my, um, mass migration in the history of African Americans, uh, social sciences, scientists who study migration categorize it into two categories, forced migration and voluntary migration. Forced migration in the history of African Americans, of course, involved the Atlantic slave trade, the internal domestic slave trade, which in the context of American or the United States history was actually, actually involved more people than the Atlantic slave trade, meaning in the United States history, more African Americans were uh, you know, sent from the, up, the upper south, Virginia, Maryland, the Chesapeake region to the newer expanding states in the deep south, such as Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, then were actually, they, that number exceeds the numbers of Africans that were initially brought to the United States. Um, some estimate, well, the latest estimate I saw was about 1.2 million uh, African Americans were uh, sent from the Chesapeake region down to the uh, expanding cotton states of the Deep South. And uh, with that, that entailed or involved, you know, the breakup of families and so forth. A lot of that history was involved in that uh, mass forced migration. Now with voluntary migration, we have the Kansas exodus that I'm gonna go into today. The great migration which began around the World War I era and the post-World War II migration which was entail, uh, involved the largest amount of individuals who migrated from the historical South to regions, other regions of the United States, okay. This map just shows the uh, African American distribution in 1890. And around 1900, approximately 90%, 89% of African Americans still resided in the South. And uh, here's just a breakdown of regional distribution. Um, by 1970, 53% of African Americans were still in the South, whereas at the beginning of the, that century, 90% were concentrated in the South. The Kansas exodus is significant in that it is the first general migration of, Af of black people after the Civil War, black Americans after the Civil War. The bulk of this uh, presentation comes from the 46th Congress, second session, report number 693 that you can find in the serial set. Report and testimony of the Select Committee of the United States Senate to investigate the causes of the removal of the Negroes from the Southern States to the Northern States. That involved three parts containing uh, two large volumes. <clears throat> There's much genealogical value in this uh, Senate investigation. Within the investigation, we have uh, recorded testimony, which includes interviews, letters, and affidavits from African American witnesses, uh, and within those affidavits and letter letters are much personal and biographical information that can potentially be used by a descendant of individuals who were involved in this migration. The historical context lies in the fact that this testimony provides abundant information that gives insight into the lives, struggles, experiences, values, ideals, and aspirations of African, African Americans living in during the post-Reconstruction period. So any family historian who wants to flesh out and, and uh, have like a broader context of what the ancestor might have uh, been, might have experienced during this period, uh, within the investigation you can see a lot of their concerns expressed within the testimony. Okay, now an example of how uh, genealogical data can uh, be found throughout the uh, investigation. Here's an example of the testimony of John O'Kelly. John O'Kelly was actually a resident of North Carolina. And towards the, uh, the tail end of the migration uh, from the Gulf states to Kansas, a newer migration began from North Carolina to Indiana. And so that migration was also included in the investigation. But here we have his uh, testimony at, uh, given during his questioning. Uh, the senator asks, where's your residence? He responds, Raleigh, North Carolina. What is your professional business? I am doing a livery business. Do you own any property or real estate? Yes, sir. 
I own some outside of the corporation of the town, and I've got a house and home. You were formerly a slave? Yes, sir, I used to belong to General Cox. How much property at a round guess are you worth now? I don't know, sir, but I would not tonight take less than 5000 for what I've got. Have you made all of that as a free man? Yes, sir, I had nothing at the time of the surrender. Okay, now, from that testimony, a potential descendant uh, can get all of that information in regards to John O'Kelly. Another example that's uh, con contained within this uh, investigation. Uh, this is from the testimony of Julius A. Bonnets. Now, Julius Bonnets was actually a white resident of uh, North Carolina who was called to the investigation. And within the investigation, you're going to see various, um, a lot of the testimony falling on uh, two different sides of the political extreme. Some were trying to minimize what was occurring in the South at that time, and others uh, were focused on uh, highlighting what was occurring with the hopes that federal troops could return to the South. So in, from Julius Bonner's perspective, what he's uh, arguing here is that in his area of North Carolina, there are actually African Americans who are prospering, which is also, which, you know, is also true. Um, there are various uh, uh, experiences that are occurring at this time. But here he says, I know a colored man living near Mount Olive, 12 miles from Goldsboro, North Carolina, who is the owner of 316 acres of land. His name is Calvin Simmons. He has, within the last year or two, finished paying for the plantation. He, brought, he bought it some years ago on long time at the rate of $10 an acre. He paid for it himself and his boys with, with what they raised from it. In my own town, there is a man named William Bernard, who is a man who owns a fine house and lot, sorry. Not long ago, I offered him $1,000 for his place, but he refused it on the ground that he did not need the money. It's well located, a valuable piece, and increasing in value every year. To uh, confirm the uh, testimony that was given by uh, Julius Bonnets, I checked our census records, and sure enough, I found Calvin Simmons in the census. And in this 1900 census, it does state whether the individual is the owner or not of their property. In this particular census, it does it says has Calvin Simmons uh, listed as a renter. It doesn't mention that he owned his property, but that you know potential descendant would uh, check other documents to confirm whether the testimony is in fact true or what the census might you know be mistaken. Now, with William Bernard, the other individual who was mentioned, uh, his census record does confirm that he was the owner of his property in North Carolina. <clears throat> Okay. Now, going into the beginnings of the uh, Kansas exodus, in the uh, Senate investigation, there was much testimony given that described a major convention movement occurring amongst African Americans during that time. Here I have a list of some of the uh, conventions that were held during the 1870s, and this doesn't cover all of the conventions. These were the ones that were mentioned in the Senate investigation. There were one, two in Alabama, one in 1872, another in 1874, a uh, color convention in Arkansas in 1877, a convention in Louisiana, 1879, Nashville, Tennessee in 1879, and Houston, Texas in 1879. And at each of these conventions, the idea of migration as a, tact a tactical response to what was occurring, you know, with the end of Reconstruction, with the removal of federal troops and so forth, that the idea of migration <clears throat> came up in each of those conventions. So that kind of goes against the idea that, you know, the migration was spontaneous or, uh, you know, when you look at some of the descriptions of the migration, it's kind of categorized as something that happened spur of the moment, and there was no planning. It was uh, the migrants were basically manipulated by outsiders and so forth. But with these conventions, we see that this the idea of migration was something that was actually discussed. The question was where could Af where could African Americans go? That was the fundamental question that was debated at these 
conventions. Okay, let me go back here. Now, at the 18, well, with these conventions, I, I just included some of the uh, statements and resolutions that were made at these conventions so that we can have, an, we can get an idea of, you know, the debate and an idea of what was occurring at that time. At the uh, 1872 Alabama Convention, <clears throat> the participants expressed the desire to try to accumulate homes or property as fast as possible. Um, throughout the testimony, you see this, this desire of African Americans to gain property. And what you see here is still that, that hope that was, you know, reflect or kind of show earlier with the whole idea of 40 acres and a mule and so forth. During this time, the ideal that many black southerners are holding on to is the hope that they could gain land, gain their own property, and become, you know, self-sufficient, independent, uh, and, and autonomous, basically. And that's an ideal that is expressed throughout the testimony. Uh, they had, the, their ideal kind of uh, fell in lines with the, the uh, characteristics of a, a yeoman farmer. Like, they, that, that was their ideal at this time, to become yeoman farmers where they would have their own land, you know, raise their own crap, crops, be self-sufficient, and so forth. So a lot of the conflict at this time is going to uh, occur when this, de this desire for land ownership uh, meets this, this new uh, system, this new sharecropping system that is going to be instituted in the South. So many of the African Americans are going to resist the idea of becoming sharecroppers. So in this early period, they're still uh, resisting it and going through this whole uh, conflict. Uh, here in the 1872 convention, um, within this last paragraph, it says, work honestly and hard for the consummation of uh, those objects. Do everything in your power to secure these, meaning land ownership, the rights of citizenship, and so forth. And if those efforts fail, it's, they said that it's time to desert Alabama and seek a land or a state where these rights are accorded. Um, in the 1874 convention, we have some of the same sentiments expressed. Um, in this last paragraph here, we see that our race have now met in convention to consider solemnly the question of their future destiny in this state and in this country. We have no reason to expect from our political opponents, now dominant in the state, the exercise of justice, mercy, or wise policy. The solemn question with us is, shall we be compelled to repeat the history of the Israelites and go into exile from the land of our nativity and our home to seek new homes and fields of enterprise beyond the reign and rule of Pharaoh, using a lot of the, uh, you know, allusions to the Bible and so forth, which was also prevalent in a lot of the uh, rhetoric during this time. Um, 1879 Colored Men's Convention at Nashville, a major complaint at that convention, you know, goes again to the new sharecropping system that is being instituted. Uh, there are complaints of... Uh, uh, farmers or sharecroppers being cheated out of their uh, wages or their crops and so forth. Um, they did not have the opportunity to get the results of their labor as they thought they should have uh, and so forth. And uh, with in, in, in falling into debt each year, at the beginning of each year, they thought it necessary now to make some change and they thought they might find some change in immigration, meaning migration. Now, Benjamin Pap Singleton was one of the major figures of the Kansas migration. Um, in his testimony, when asked for his motive in seeking colonies in Kansas, or seeking to establish black colonies, he said, well, my people for the one of land. We needed land for our children. Their disadvantages caused my heart to grieve and sorrow. Pity for my race, sir, that was coming down instead of going up. That caused me to go to work for them. This was gotten up by colored men in purity and, and confidence. Not a political Negro was in it. Oh no, it was the muscle of the arm, the men that worked that we wanted. And within Benjamin Paff Singleton's testimony, what we see here is he's making a clear uh, attempt to separate his movement from any type of uh, outside influence because that was an accusation that was being made by some of the politicians. They argued that you know, these people uh, clearly are being manipulated by politicians and so forth. But 
Benjamin Singleton is saying that no, this is really a grassroots movement and he's trying to facilitate a desire that was expressed amongst his people. Um, here are just some more of Benjamin Singleton's testimony. He says, with this migration, part of, it, part of his attempt was to learn the South a lesson. <clears throat> One of the senators asked him, suppose the, uh, the white people were to treat them well, speaking of African Americans in the South or his Benjamin Singleton's community. Uh, suppose they were treated well and were given their rights as American citizens and given what they earned, would not that stop the exodus? He answered, allow me to say to you that confidence has perished and faded away. They have been lied to every year. We don't want to leave the South, and just as soon as we have confidence in the South, I'm going to be an instrument in the hands of God to persuade every man to go back, because that is the best country. That is genial to our nature. We love that country, and it is the best country in the world for us, but we are going to learn the South a lesson. You believe then, there is no way to stop the exodus except by stopping the abuse of these people, by treating them fairly, and that it will take some time to get their confidence even then. They will go back. I have heard some say they will never go back, but they will go back. Another major figure in the, uh, ex in the migration to Kansas was uh, Henry Adams. Henry Adams was a Army veteran, uh, and within his state of Louisiana, he and other uh, black veterans formed an organization called the, uh, originally called the Colored Men's Protective Union, which consisted of approximately 500 members. And what they initially uh, attempted to do was investigate the living conditions of black field workers in various southern states. Henry Adams claims that they enrolled over 98,000 names of uh, black field workers who were interested in leaving the South. Most of the names collected were from Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas, with uh, a minority of names from Mississippi, Alabama, and a few other states. Um, Henry Adams, within his testimony, he stated that he was an Army veteran. So I checked our records here to confirm that, and what I have here is uh, Henry Adams' military service record, uh, confirming that he indeed had served in the Army, in the regular Army. Okay. And I have here Henry Adams' Freedman's Bank record that gives uh, his physical description, uh, his residence at that time, which was Shreveport, Louisiana. And it also provides the name of his mother, his parents, and his siblings. And gives his place of birth, uh, Jasper County, Georgia, and his occupation as a wood chopper, sorry. Now, just, I included that record to show how potentially a descendant of any of these uh, individuals can uh, find records here at the National Archives that can provide, you know, a, a great deal of information. And the Freedmen's Bank record itself, the idea of, of looking for that was kind of uh, uh, given to me from the testimony itself because a major complaint given by some of the migrants, especially in Louisiana, was uh, based on or, or focused on the money that they lost when the Freedmen's Bank fell. You know, they, that was a major complaint. Some were asking to be reimbursed for the money that they lost. Now, Henry Adams' organization compiled a list of what they call outrages in Louisiana that occurred from 1866 to 1876. Um, and this gives, you know, more insight into some of the violence that occurred during a period in which the South, you know, was being redeemed, you know, by the Democrats during that period. And here's just an example of some of the incidents. He, the, this list actually occurs of over 600 incidents, incidents that were recorded. Example, Frank Hayes, colored, was badly beaten and all of his crops taken from him, about six or eight miles northeast of Port Hudson. On Frank Vu's plantation, <clears throat> and Mr. Frank Vu was captain of the crowd of all white men who done it, all white men, 1876. William Henry hung dead by a large crowd of white men about four miles east of St. Martinsville because he refused to let them take his crop. This was done December 1875. William Monroe colored was shot and badly wounded for voting a Republican ticket. 
He was shot by armed white men in the year 1874. Samuel Smith badly whipped and bloodied by Captain Scott because he went to church without his consent. Then made, they made him run away and leave his crop, done July 4, 1875. All of that type of testimony was given to, uh, you know, by Henry Adams' organization to basically uh, provide evidence or information to show why they desired to leave that, their particular state. Um, George T. Ruby was actually an, an, an African-American northerner who moved south after the Civil War in order to help with uh, some of the activities of the uh, Freedmen's Bureau. He was a Freedmen's Bureau agent, later became a state senator in Texas. And upon the redemption of Texas, he moved to Louisiana and began to work as an uh, educator. But when the level of violence began to arise, really rise in Louisiana, he joined Henry Adams' movement to try to assist it. And I included some of his statements uh, regarding the uh, atmosphere during that period in Louisiana. Here he says, the only remedy left to colored citizen in many parishes of our state today is to emigrate. There are sections of Louisiana where the condition of things is such that the very best thing that could be done for all concerned would be for the colored people to leave and go away entirely. Okay. And here he goes more into it, speaking on, uh, it's pregnant that we do not enjoy those certain inalienable rights which the Constitution has given us. We have, as American citizens, been citizens indeed in, in word, and have performed the part or role assigned to us with loyalty, and we now ask the government to see to it that we have given to us what the Constitution awards. We have been liberated only to, be, to become worse than slave. Law and equity in the South are not for the black man. Hence, this attempt to better our condition by migration is the only solace left us. We have counted the cost of this movement. We know that it is improvident for some of us, but why hesitate between two evils? We will accept the lesser of the two and trust God for deliverance from further evil. If we remain here, we will, we will have to undergo the same merciless treatment endured by us on the eve of every election, as well as being defrauded out of all we earn by the sweat of our brows. Liberty to the Negro in the South is a mockery. Uh, and here I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this is just a, a letter that the Colored Men's Convention in uh, Louisiana sent to President Hayes at that time. And uh, hopefully it's in your handouts, it's clear enough for you to read. But basically he's there uh, in this letter there explaining again some of the uh, violence and so forth and some of their grievances at that time. The letter to Rutherford B. Hayes included uh, three resolutions, again asking that their rights guaranteed to them be restored and that um, they have protection, um, asking that Congress restore back to them the savings that were lost to them by the failure of the Freedmen's Bank and asking, again, for political protection, that we as a race will abstain from voting on all national questions and at, and at elections for national officers unless we have full protection in our own officers to guard our interests and rights and so forth. Now, for any who are, who are interested in a you know, more detailed investigation of what was occurring in the South at that time, I just included an earlier investigation which was the, uh, the use of the army in certain of the southern states, you know, during 1876. And that investigation, which was around the time of, you know, the compromise of 1877, uh, when, <clears throat> you know, as part of Rutherford B. Hayes gaining the presidency, it was kind of agreed that federal troops would be re removed out of the south. Uh, before that, uh, around the time that I, that occurred, uh, the House of Representatives asked that all correspondence between uh, the former president and military commanders in the South be given or transmitted to the House of Representatives. And within that particular investigation, um, there's a detailed list of, you know, the reasons uh, that the Army was being uh, kept in certain states such as uh, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida especially. And through there, it goes through a lot of the um, uh, violence and so forth that was occurring. OSB Wall was the president of the Immigrant 
Aid Society here in Washington, D.C. Osby Wall was actually a highly educated uh, African American who had served as a, an officer during in the, uh, with, in, within the, with the Union Army during the Civil War, sorry. And uh, after the Civil War, he worked in the Freedmen's Bureau as a transportation agent. Um, later, during the Kansas exodus, he formed the Immigrant Aid Society, which uh, intended to assist those who were trying to uh, migrate to Kansas. And he was also called to give testimony at the investigation. Again, uh, just using him as an example, I got his Freedmen's Bank record, which provides his physical description and the names of uh, members of his family, place of birth, and so forth. And at the time that he made his Freedmen's Bank uh, deposit, he was still in employment of the uh, Freedmen's Bureau. Also, from the uh, records, finding that he was a transportation agent for the Freedmen's Bureau, I found some of his particular records where here in the Washington, D.C. area, where so many uh, freedmen were uh, coming from the outlying areas of Virginia and Maryland into D.C., um, one of the activities of the Freedmen's Bureau at that time was to try to find employment for some of this population and provide transportation to them north, and to, especially to areas such as uh, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, and also Ohio. So, and that's something that he did uh, be, uh, prior to the uh, Kansas exodus. So when the uh, Kansas exodus began, he basically kind of resumed some of that activity that he had experience with as a Freedmen's Bureau agent. Now, throughout the testimony, only men are called as witnesses. <clears throat> So if you just take the testimony at face value, you would assume only men or males were involved in the Kansas exodus. But within the testimony, we have this from John Henry, Henry Birch, who was an, another educated uh, African-American in Louisiana who was called to give testimony. <clears throat> and speaking on the influence of women in uh, the uh, Louisiana movement, he says, the women have had more to do with it than all the politics and men in the country. They have been very active since 1868 in all the political movements. They form a large number in all the political assemblages, and they have evidenced a deep interest in all that pertains to politics. There's in New Orleans today a committee formed in 1878 that was called the Committee of 500 Women, of which Mrs. Mrs. Mary J. Garnett is president. Her name now is Mary Jane Nelson. She married this year. Now, in Louisiana, what this suggests is that at the same time that Henry Adams had his organization, <clears throat> uh, the Colored Men's Protective Union, which later became the Colonization Council, at, uh, simultaneous with that, you have women who had their own organization in Louisiana that was also involved in working in uh, working in coordination with the, uh, the men. Okay, now we're gonna go into some of the records that focus specifically on the Kansas exodus. Here I just have a map that shows sort of the path that was taken by many of the uh, migrants. Now that first quote that I gave at the beginning, that description does pertain to some of the migrants, but not all of them. You have two major groups of migrants at this time. In states such as Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and so forth, they, had be, uh, they began a movement a little bit earlier to Kansas, which kind of uh, resembles the general movement west of all Americans at that time. You know, like the, uh, you know, the uh, tradition of the pioneers that we have where individuals move west to get land. Uh, Benjamin Papp Singleton's movement falls in that category. With them, they kind of had long-term planning, they organized it, they uh, located land in Kansas that they felt would be a good location, and they saved money and so forth and uh, moved across from Missouri, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, and so forth to St. Louis and then traveled on across to uh, Kansas to form colonies. What's gonna occur uh, in the Gulf states, with the redemption of states such as Louisiana and uh, Mississippi, is the level of violence at that time is going to be so extreme that the second category is just going to leave almost with 
just the clothes on their backs. You know, a lot of them are going to, uh, I guess, fall into the category of almost war refugees, where they're fleeing, you know, a concerted and systematic type of violence against them and terrorism, which was basically used to intimidate and force African Americans out of, you know, the political system at that time. So with, especially with Louisiana's redemption that is occurring, uh, many of them, when they hear about this idea of Kansas as a place that, you know, African Americans can get land and form colonies, many of them are just going to flee um, and, or steamships up to St. Louis and then travel across Missouri on to Kansas to get land. So with them, they kind of fall into that, that into the description of that quote that was given at the beginning. Here's just a, uh, another photo of Benjamin Papp Singleton and some of the migrants uh, from who were going to his colonies on a steamship. Okay. Some of the black towns and settlements that were formed in Kansas uh, are listed here. The only one that I know of that still exists today is Nicodemus, Graham County, Kansas. Some of the other ones eventually uh, died. Some became, you know, uh, incorporated into larger nearby communities, such as Topeka and, and other uh, towns and so forth. And now they're kind of became neighborhoods within larger jurisdictions and so forth. But these towns were formed throughout Kansas. And then later, many individuals are going to move on to Oklahoma and other parts of the West, but especially Oklahoma is going to be the site of, you know, I guess the, the largest number of um, black towns and settlements in the West during that period. But Kansas is the initial state that many of these migrants are going to. And many ask me, why Kansas? Um, during this time, during the 1870s, the idea of Kansas became um, idealized as, you know, the home, or they looked at it as the home or the native, what they felt was the home of John Brown and the home of certain free state sentiments um, prior to the Civil War and so forth. So with all of that, the idea of Kansas as a place um, that will be welcoming is going to really come to the forefront during this time. Okay. Here I just have some of the records of individuals. Well, this particular individual was one of the colonists at Benjamin Singleton's colony in uh, Dunlap, Kansas. Uh, I found this individual in this uh, census record and used him as an example of how other records can be found once, you know, a name and, uh, and so forth is found. I located Henry Stewart in our track books for Morris County, Kansas. <clears throat> and with, within our track books, we are given the legal description of the land. With the legal description, you can then go find the land case files, which can provide you with more information on the uh, settler. After getting the land case files I got here um, from the Topeka Land Office, the certificate showing that Stewart had pur purchased the lot um, at that particular colony. Here's just an early town site plan for Nicodemus, Kansas that I included, and a print map of Nicodemus, Kansas from 1906. Now, <clears throat> Zachary T. Fletcher and Jenny Smith Fletcher were uh, migrants from uh, Kentucky initially who settled in Nicodemus Colony. I found their pictures at the, well, from the Library of, of Congress's collection. Um, I got their pictures uh, as settlers of Nicodemus. And since I had their pictures, I just adopted them as my imaginary ancestors and used them as a case study of how uh, records can be found here at the National Archives. And I did that just because I had their pictures. <laughs> now, using this Fletcher family, I first went to our census records and found them in the 1880 census for Nicodemus, Kansas. And here we have the family. I know you can't see it clearly, but it has uh, Zachary T. Fletcher as the postmaster for uh, Nicodemus, Kansas, along with his wife, Frances, and the two children, uh, Thomas and Josephine. After going to the census records, I went into our track books for Graham County, Kansas, and found uh, the Fletcher fam Fletcher's uh, legal description his, of his land, the legal description of his land. And from there, I was able to locate his land case files. 
And here's his homestead, his original homestead affidavit for the land that he has settled upon. And you know, for homesteads, basically, the settler just had to make improvements upon that land. And upon sh proving that, you know, the necessary improvements were made, the settler would be awarded the land by the government. And in his affidavits, basically, he's making his case that he has made improvements upon the land. Here he says, I am now residing on the land I desire to enter, and I've made a bona fide improvement and settlement thereon. That said, settlement was commenced about February 10th, 1881, and that my improvements consist of a dugout, a stone house under erection, and 50 acres of breaking. Okay. Here we have uh, more information saying Zachary T. Fletcher, or Z.T. Fletcher, being first duly sworn, claimed settlement on the 25th day, July 1882, <clears throat> and I have been with my family on said land at various times, but have not made continuous residence on the account of being appointed and commissioned postmaster of Nicodemus Graham County, Kansas. I also placed there on my soldier's homestead entry that I was a private of Captain John Cook, Company B, 8th Regiment of the United States Colored Artillery as shown by a copy of my discharge. I further swear that owing to my financial affairs, the severe drought causing an entire failure of my crops during the first two years of my filing and entry and poor health of my wife, I was unable to keep my family on said land. In consideration of my services as a soldier and postmaster of Nicodemus, Kansas, my cultivation and improvements on said land, I make this affidavit to the commissioner to complete my title to said land. Okay. To all whom the, these present shall come greeting, whereas on the 14th day, <clears throat> April 1884, Zachary T. Fletcher was appointed postmaster at Nicodemus, Kansas. Just giving uh, proof that he, he that he was, or documentation that he was the postmaster of Nicodemus, Kansas. And at some point, he uh, Zach, uh, Zachary Fletcher lost his discharge documents, so he received a soldier certificate that proved that he had served in the military and. His soldier certificate says, know ye that this is to certify that Zachary Fletcher, private of Captain John Cook's Company B, 8th Regiment, United States Colored Artillery, volunteers, who was enrolled on the 16th day of June, 1864, to serve three years during the war, was honorably discharged from the military service of the United States on the 10th day of February, 1866, at Victoria, Texas. Okay. Now, from, you know, the information got, uh, gather from his land records, we see that he's served in the military, so logically we would search for his military records, and that's what I have here. This is the outside covering of his uh, military service records, um, confirming that he has served in the US, 8th U.S. Colored Artillery. And these are just the first two cards, well, the first and the last cards of his uh, service records given a physical description and his uh, muster out information, a discharge information, okay? Now with uh, Zachary Fletcher, <clears throat> going from the military uh, service records, um, I looked into his, just checked to see whether he had a uh, military pension file, mil military pension records. And within his pension records, uh, Zachary Fletcher provided an autobiographical type letter to try to prove who he was because, again, think um, when you consider uh, pension records, basically the veteran had to prove, or in the case that the veteran was dead, the widow had to prove that the veteran had indeed served in the military and was the person uh, that the veteran was, was claiming to be and so forth. So here he's basically given as much information that he has on himself and his history to prove that he is indeed Zachary Fletcher and deserving of his military pension. And uh, within the letter he says, Your Honor, my dear sir, I being raised a slave, I have no record of my age. And if there is any, I do not know anything of it. My first master was a bachelor and he died when I was a baby and willed all of his slaves to his sister Mary who had married a man by the name of Anthony Robb. She died in a few years and we were all divvied out with our children. And we never all got together until after the war. 
In the year, in the year 1856-57, I was bound out to a man by the name of Isaac Davis as a race rider. I guess he raced horses, that's what I assume, as a race rider. <laughs> he died in 1863. I stayed with his family until June 1864, at which time I joined the Army. And two days later, my mistress, Mrs. Ellen Davis, came into my camp and tried to get me out on the grounds that I would not be 19 years old until the 12th of August of the same year. But as I had on my uniform and had been sworn in, she could not get me out. Next, I went to see my father just before he died in 1913. And he told me that I was born August 12, 1845, the same year that Zachary Taylor fought the Mexican War, and that my master, Robert Fletcher, being of the same political party, named me after him, Zachary Taylor Fletcher. The above is the best mostly that I can give you of my age, as all of my old white people and all of my brothers and sisters of 10 are dead. Mother died when I was nine years old and my father died three years ago at the age of 93. We colored slaves knew nothing of the census and all of the above acts was in McCracken County, Kentucky, five miles west of Paducah, or Paducah, Kansas. I mean, Kentucky, sorry. <laughs> um, so basically, with his military pension records, all of this information was provided, given the, the names of his uh, former owners, um, place of birth, uh, family members, an approximate date of when he was born. Remember, many you know, ex-slaves did not know their birth dates, because those type of records just weren't kept, and so forth. So. All of that information was provided in this pension file and can be of good use to a potential descendant. Okay, and in closing, I will say <clears throat> the social, speaking of the social and cultural ramifications of migration, the movement of individuals and families from one place to another produces a wide variety of changes in the individuals and families involved in the sending and receiving communities and in the larger areas of which the sending and receiving communities are a part of. That's actually a quote from Black Migration of Social Demographic History. Okay. Um, the Kansas exodus is important, in particular the uh, investigation of it, in that within that testimony, a lot of the later uh, problems, a lot of the social conditions, a lot of the grievances experienced by African Americans were already uh, being highlighted or already being experienced. Um, when you look at some of the documents such as um, from the Department of Labor uh, with their investigation of the uh, migration, the, first, the beginning of the uh, Great Migration around World War, the World War I period, a lot of the reasons behind that migration is basically going to be the same as a lot of the grievances expressed in the testimony of the Kansas Exodus, meaning that from the period of this migration to the Great Migration, which began in the 20th century, in the uh, teens, basically the same problems experienced by African Americans in the South are going to continue, and basically are going to become, you know, uh, codified and systematized as the Jim Crow system. You know, so the desire for education and so forth is the desire for freedom from uh, violence, the desire for uh, you know, the opportunity to have political participation and so forth, a lot of that is going to be expressed later during the World War I period. The only difference is during the Kansas migration, the African Americans are still holding on to that, that desire for land, you know, the desire to own their own land. They still desire to be farmers, self, you know, sufficient independent farmers and so forth. By the time of the Great Migration, the ideal of becoming farmers is somewhat going to be diminished somewhat, sorry. Um, at that time, the desire is going to be for better paying jobs because by that point, they're now basically, for the most part, not all, but um, the masses of African Americans in the South were in, that, in, in the sharecropping system by that point. You know, so instead of being sharecroppers, many are going to desire to find uh, better employment and during the period of the First World War, that's going to open up in northern cities when the migration from Europe is cut off because of the war. And uh, the need for labor is going to 
um, lead to recruiters going to the South and then it's gonna become a self-perpetuating migration um, that continues throughout most of the 20th century after the Second World War and basically it's gonna reverse itself after 1970. From 1970 and increasing each decade from that point, uh, the numbers of African Americans actually migrating from other regions to the South has increased each decade, even even more so now, and that's increased, you know, m even more in the 2000s. Okay. And in closing, uh, <clears throat> in the post-Reconstruction era, numerous African Americans began to view migration as a legitimate option and tactical choice to gain those aspects of freedom and human rights or civil rights that had been stripped from them in the South. It was a grassroots movement that was organized by field laborers despite opposition from many leading members of the educated black elite at that time. And even Frederick Douglass was opposed to the migration. And he was holding on to the hope that the uh, federal government would you know, send troops back into the South and protect you know, uh, Southerners, black Southerners who were trying to engage in the political process. Um, they sought economic independence through land ownership, education, political freedom, security from violence, and religious and social freedom, along with the chance to build and maintain a strong family life. This migration highlights their own unique pursuit of happiness in America. All of this is, is, is expressed in their testimony. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Is there an index to the MIDI report? Yeah, well, there's an index of the names of witnesses. Within, it, within the uh, serial set volume, um, all of the witnesses called are indexed for each part of the volume. There are three parts of the investigation. And for each part, it has its own name index. And that was argument or biography of each? Um, it, ha it has a short description of the person. And what about uh, index by state? No, no index by state. But it does, within the name index, sometimes it does have the state of that person, but there's no separate state index. Just the uh, name index and the brief description, very brief description of the person. Yes? And if you're looking at the Kansas settlements, black settlements in Kansas, did you run across Fort Scott, Kansas? Uh, I don't recall it specifically, but Many of the settlements weren't, I, there were many settlements that I didn't include on that list that I had. Just some of the ones that were mentioned within, you know, some of the documents that I was looking at. But for the settlements, there are more than I had in the presentation itself. They, those were just an example. And even the conventions that I mentioned, there were more conventions held in the 1870s than those that I showed. But, you know, that, the black colony movement is going to occur throughout that period throughout Kansas and expand into Oklahoma where even more of them are going to be established and in other states in the West during that period. Is okay. there any centralized record of where those black settlements in Kansas were in your research? No, no federal records. None, none in the federal records. Okay. Yes. Now, now for places like Missouri, uh, Tennessee, with uh, Benjamin Papp Singleton's group, um, Kentucky, those, uh, some of those settlements and some of those colonists actually moved prior to the 1870s. Some began, at, you know, even in the 1860s, towards the uh, second half, the latter half of the 1860s, and continue on through the 70s. It's just in the 1870s, the the number of migrants is really going to, you know, increase substantially because of the situation in the South at that time. That's going to kind of motivate many who might not have, you know, desired to migrate before to now uh, migrate as a reaction to what's occurring in the South. But for, for those from Missouri, a lot of them, you know, were part of that group that really organized and, you know, um, had, you know, more long-term plans for, you know, their settlement and so forth, you know, and, and 
you know, in terms of, you know, going to Kansas and getting the land and, and so forth and having, you know, some resources when they made the move. You know. Yes. You had mentioned that Kansas was like the first site of the mass uh, migration, and then, but Oklahoma ended up with more black towns. Um, my father was actually born in Bowie, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. one of the black towns, and then moved, his family moved to Wichita. Mm. So <laughs> it seems like it's the opposite. Can, can you explain why uh, Kansas, why they started going more to Oklahoma than to Kansas? Oklahoma, now, I, don't quote me on this, but from the reading, and I'll, I'll look into that again, but I think during that period, Oklahoma is going to have some type of incentives for, you know, getting land and so forth. And from that point, a lot of the um, um, uh, motivation is going to move towards Oklahoma, just from the practical aspect of it, you know, um, whatever those incentives were, I can't recall them specifically right now. Um, but there's the, the opportunity to get land in the o Oklahoma is going to make that an attractive alternative. You know, and by that time, you know, the situation in Kansas had reached a saturation point. Um, you know, there wasn't as much land to get any more. By that time, the, um, you know, the romanticized ideal of Kansas had diminished somewhat. And the I Oklahoma is going to arise as a major alternative. Some other states also, but mainly Oklahoma. But I guess, you know, a lot of the movement is going to be, you know, based on the individual's, you know, um, own desires and opportunities also. So I know, you know, there'll be instances of, you know, a person moving from, you know, one state to another based on, you know, an uh, opportunity that m might have presented itself and so forth, you so know. Should I look at Oklahoma State documents to kind of get an idea if they did provide some incentives? Y yes. It, it, yes. And, and if I can, you know, if I could get your email address if I, you know, just go back and look <laughs> through my own notes and um, I can just send you anything that I come across. Yes. Okay, what did you find most intriguing while doing your research? What really stood out to you? Was there anything in particular, or did you really see a trend? Um, I found there was a lot that I found intriguing, from individuals to um, just information that I wasn't aware of. You know, like for instance, the convention movement. You know, I wasn't, I hadn't come across that in any of my, you know, history classes or whatever. Um, I knew about an earlier convention movement in the North during the 1700s amongst free blacks, you know. But a convention movement in the South during the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction period, I wasn't aware of. And also the, the idea of migration being so heavily debated, you know, amongst African Americans in an organized way. I wasn't aware of that, you know, because uh, from a lot of the secondary material of the Exoduster movement, some of the early materials uh, categorized it as, you know, just a spontaneous type of movement, you know, almost like cattle or something, you know, a stampede, um, that the people weren't really thinking about what they were doing. They either they were, um, there was political manipulation behind these poor people who didn't know, even, know better. But through the testimony, through individuals and, you know, other forms of evidence such as the conventions, you see that it was something that was, you know, greatly debated and organized, and the individuals made the decisions regardless of what their so-called leaders felt about it. You know, because some of the biggest leaders at that point still thought that or still hoped that, you know, blacks could maintain, maintain political participation and political power in the South. You know, and so from Frederick Douglass's perspective, since blacks as a population were concentrated in the South, that would be the best place for them to maintain, you know, political, you know, um, influence or political power, you know, and also um, economic power, you know, um, just to remain there and, and hopefully things would get better, you know, at some point. But many throughout the testimony of those who were involved in the migration, a lot of, many of them weren't formally educated individuals, but they were individuals who had gained like a form of um, 
uh, informal education, I guess I would call it, such as Henry Adams. You know, many of them were veterans. They had served in the military. Um, they had learned to read while they were in the, in the military. And you had self-taught individuals. Benjamin Singleton was actually a person who had, he had escaped from slavery, during slavery. He escaped to Canada from Tennessee, later moved to Detroit. And then after the Civil War, when slavery was over, he moved back to his uh, hometown in Tennessee. And in Tennessee, he was a respected person in that community amongst African Americans because he was a skilled worker, he was a carpenter, he, he uh, made coffins, and, it, and he was a coffin maker and, and an undertaker. So he had various skills, various jobs, and just, just the general respect amongst people in the community. And it was through his job as an undertaker and uh, cabinet ma uh, coffin maker uh, that he was kind of inspired to just form this colony movement because part of that occupation required that he, you know, um, get the bodies of individuals who died as a result of violence and so forth. So after seeing that, he, you know, came up with the idea, well, probably we should just leave and go form colonies where we can gain land and peace and not become sharecroppers and, you know, dependent on someone else and so forth. So that's going to kind of motivate him. But they fell into the, I guess, the class of individuals who were kind of self-taught, self-educated, and they did not come from the that organized or if that the formally educated community, you know. And um, even George Ruby, who I quoted in ten, in uh, Louisiana, he was someone who was very educated, but throughout his testimony, he said that he only came to assist a movement that was already occurring because he had drawn the same conclusions that they had drawn for themselves. And he felt that he could use his education and his ability to write and so forth to just assist them and word the letters and so forth the way they wanted to and send it to uh, the uh, president and so forth. But it wasn't a movement that came uh, from someone above and, you know, manipulating it from the top down. It wasn't that type of movement, you know. Thank you. Yes. I just wondered where was the, uh, the uh, increase in the number of discriminatory raids about uh, colored fountains, colored schools, uh, not riding buses, and the Ku Klux Klan during this period of time. Maybe that didn't yeah. move toward that direction. See, that's gonna that's gonna come later. What we have now is is kind of that conflict where the Troops have just recently been removed from the South, you know, because of the Compromise of 1877. The kind of the deal that was made was that there was a contested election in 1876, where uh, as far, the compromise that was decided was that Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, would be allowed to, you know, get the White House if the federal troops were removed from the South. So that was a compromise that everyone could agree upon. So by the time of most of this, by the time of the Senate investigation, the political will is already gone as far as protecting, you know, African Americans in the South. You know, at this time, you know, the political mood is now just moving on, moving on from the Civil War and the division in the nation and trying to bring everyone together and move forward. And part of that required, you know, just leaving, you know, the African Americans to the will of, you know, their neighbors in the South. And the, now, during this period, the question is, okay, what, how, amongst African Americans, okay, it's how do we respond to this? What do we do about, do we wait and hope that, you know, troops are re returned to the South? Uh, do we submit to our new role as sharecroppers and, you know, um, which many of them characterize as just a new form of slavery where they're dependent? And with that, they'll have to give up on their dream of owning their own land and own farms and so forth. Or do they leave the South and go somewhere where they will be allowed to pursue their own desires, you know, and their own form of citizenship and so forth? So all of this is happening. Kansas comes up as you know, perhaps a place that they could, you know, go. As earlier, there were even some who were entertaining the idea of going to Liberia, you know. They had given up completely that there was anywhere um, 
in the continental United States that would be hospitable to them. But with Kansas, when th that idea kind of spreads, that's going to be the new focus. And later, some are going to move to other areas in the West. But when gradually the whole movement is going to cease because when it reaches a saturation point in these places and, and so forth, the, the, the motivation to go there is not going to be to the same extent when it doesn't live up to everyone's ideals and so forth. So for a period of years, there, the masses of African Americans are going to submit, not really, I don't want to use that